Good evening. Good evening. This, this is interactive. Good evening. And so I'd like to welcome you all to the city's Civic Engagement 101. We haven't done this in quite a while, but as the council was so excited to provide this opportunity for residents, and we really believe that this is something that should be done on a regular basis. And because of that, um, we have this event tonight, and hopefully we will continue to do things like this to encourage um, residents to get involved and, and encourage residents of all ages. One of the things that's very important about engagement is to start young, too. So we really need to start thinking about how do we engage our young high school students, because they are our future. And so I see a few young people in the audience, and so I am so happy about that but who I also see are council members here, and I'd like to acknowledge them. Um, we have Nora Najelski eichner who is our majority leader. We have Josh Goldstein sitting next to her. We have um, Heather Dunn. Yo, I always say it wrong. Johan Lopez up front. And we also have Fred Wilms, who is with the Republican Town Committee and has served in in Hartford, you're still doing that. And so we appreciate, not you're not, not in Hartford anymore. So we appreciate you being here. Um, you've been a staple in this community. So I, and I know that you know how, how civic engagement and how the city operates, but it's always good to see folks who know that still wanna come and participate and provide knowledge. So we really appreciate that. Um, but we also have here this evening that we would be doing presentations. We have Jessica Vonishek, who is the Chief of Staff for Economic and Community De Development. We have Steve Kleppen, who is the Director of Planning and Zoning. We have Deputy Chief, am I getting this right? In the police department. I just had a, a, a senior moment, Chief, Deputy Chief. Terry, Terry Blake. Blake. And, 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 and I'll tell you why I feel bad about that, because I worked for the police department for 10 years with a law enforcement grant, but that was a long time ago. But I know Terry Blake. And last but not least, we have uh, Chief Lamont Daniels from Community Services. And we also have newly hired Jared Schmidt, who uh, is our finance CFO for the city of Norwalk. And I think, what are you, you're fresh here, right? <laughs> two and a half months, um, but we're happy to have him here. And we know that we're gonna do great things. And I also wanna thank our IT department who's been putting this together, making sure that this works for about the last two hours or so. And so we are glad to have folks online and folks present. And so with that, I'm going to turn this over to Jessica Vonishek, who will be leading this. Um... Yep, are you gonna do that? Yes. Oh, I, who am I? <laughs> you know what? I'm Darlene Young, and thank you for that. And I am the um, council president. And so I, I love the role that I am in. I love what I'm doing and I'm so happy to be here, but thank you for that. And who are you? I love that. Everybody <laughs> here is that. So Jessica, um, thank you very much. Hey everybody, uh, Jessica Vonishek, Chief of Economic and Community Development. Uh, so this is really great, actually, because we've been doing a couple different forums that the city haven't, hasn't done in a really long time. Um, we did an enforcement forum just a couple weeks ago, and now Norwalk 101. And uh, it's just an opportunity for us to be able to talk a little bit about City Hall and what we do here at different teams, and also to get to know new faces and um, new folks coming into the city of Norwalk, and also people who have lived here for a really long time and may just not know who to reach out to or what we look like after three years of all sort of being stuck in our houses and um, homes and, and things like that. So actually in 2019, um, the mayor had 19 direct reports and you know that's a lot of direct reports, especially for a city that's growing um, like the city of Norwalk is. And in, at that point in time, the common council actually voted to be able to restructure city hall. And part of that organizational structure was to be able to bring like-minded or like-missioned groups together, teams together in City Hall. And as a result of that, um, you have the chiefs that sit before you. Our positions really didn't exist five years ago. The Economic Community Development Office didn't exist five years ago. Um, business Development and Tourism did not and Transportation, Mobility and Parking. So, you know, um, along with many other different departments that you're gonna hear about um, this evening. 
But as a result of that reorganization, the mayor now has nine direct reports. And that means that the chiefs gets to get to be able to work with four or five different departments in more of a succinct way. And so the objective of that is to streamline and make government more efficient and to really uh, that focuses on communication, right? If we don't have good communication internally and good communication with the community, then we're not able to do our jobs as effectively as we need to. Um, and so what you're going to hear tonight are the different teams that the mayor uh, and the Common Council put together over the last five years. Um, you're going to hear about the department's mission statements, what the leadership teams look like, um, and you're going to hear a little bit about um, what committees and commissions work with the city departments. The commissions are really important. Um, they are different groups of people. They are usually volunteer. Well, they're always volunteers. They're appointed by the mayor and then um, sworn in at common council meetings um, and voted on there. And you're going to see different commissions that are presented to you this evening. And that really adds to the transparency of how the city of Norwalk works. It adds to the voice that we have at the table, not only in building budgets, but in being able to build programs and policies and being able to make decisions about city assets and resources. And so I really um, am excited for the team to be able to show you uh, what those commissions look like. I think part of the objective of this evening is to be able to talk about not only the departments and what they do, but also to sort of do a show and tell and almost like a sales pitch to you about the commissions, because we're always looking for residents who are interested in getting involved. And getting involved means really just submitting your resume and saying, hey, I really like these five commissions and I think I could probably do a really good job here. And so um, it's not necessarily a complicated process, but if people don't know how the commissions work and they don't know that they're so accessible to you and showing interest, um, then, you, then people don't know it and we may not get the representation that we need or want. And also we may not get those ideas when people are really thinking about what's going on out in the city. And so I hope you enjoy this evening. Um, Jared Smith, our CFO, is going to kick it off with his uh, description of his team and we'll go from there. And please, um, if you do have questions, feel free to ask as we go along. the mouse here so I don't know why I'm struggling with the computer. There we go. I just need to right. Good evening everybody. Uh, my name is Jared Schmidt. I'm the chief financial officer for the city of Norwalk. Uh, again I started about two and a half months ago. I know we have a lot to get through here so I'm gonna uh, I'll I'll get right into it. Um, thank you, Jessica and, and Darlene for, for kicking things off here. Uh, so the, uh, the finance department, we have really about eight different functions that, uh, that are within the purview of the finance department. Um, and then let me uh, try to operate this as I'm going along. Uh, the overseeing control, this is just kind of a general statement. Oh, it's not shared. shared. Okay. To oversee and control the funds of the city and supply the information and automation needs of, of the city. Uh, before I get into the individual departments, I'll just give you an overview uh, of all the different departments and all the different uh, functions of the department of uh, my team. Um, so there's the, uh, the tax assessor, the tax collector, purchasing, uh, IT information technology, the comptroller, management and budgets, and uh, risk management. Uh, those are all the different aspects of uh, that fall within the finance department. Um, so let's we'll start with the tax assessor. Uh, yeah, everybody's heard about heard of the grand list. Everybody knows now about uh, revaluation that took place, um, and, and the uh, hopefully understand something about the impact of of what that is doing and and uh, saw the assessment of your homes. So that's 
That's the assessor's job. The assessor uh, does the analysis, uh, working with a uh, working with a consultant to determine what the values of all the different properties in the in the town are: motor vehicle, real estate, uh, business, personal property, um, and and all those collectively uh, come together to create the grand list. Uh, the assessor is also in charge of um, and has oversight of implementing the um, implementing the different programs of the state, uh, different tax exemptions that the state offers to um, elderly, uh, disabled veterans um, that also fall within the assessor's auspices. Uh, and, and the uh, you know as we as was mentioned early on, the importance of getting involved in some of the associated boards uh, for the assessor that board is that they work with is the board of assessment appeals um, and so once those uh, once those property values are determined uh, you as a resident have the option to go forward and to and to file with the uh, board of assessment appeals and appeal for for your property value so if you think it's too high then you, uh, you have the option to do that um, and so this separate board was created, uh, it's created in stat in state statute. Um, and, and that's what they do. It's really a, um, it's a review board. Uh, they don't, uh, they don't create or assign the value to the property, but they, uh, review what is, um, what was done and how, and how the, uh, how the property values were determined and can, um, uh, come up with a, a, a different uh, a different property value if they determine that that's appropriate. Uh, the the direct the assessor is uh, his name is Paul Gorman. He was uh, recently appointed. He's been with the with the city for uh, for a while, it's over over a year or so, or so. But he was recently officially appointed as the assessor for the city. And then to kind of continue along in the process, uh, once those values are determined and finalized, uh, they go to the tax collector. And our, our tax collector is Lisa Biagirelli. Um, and so the, the, the tax collector, the uh, tax collector's department is uh, charged with, uh, as, the name, uh, as the name implies, uh, collecting your taxes, sending out the tax bills twice a year, that are due July 1st um, and then payable with without interest by August 1st and then again uh, January 1st and payable by uh, February 1st with, with no interest. Um, and uh, the, it's not just the, it's not just your real estate taxes or, or car taxes, it's also uh, sewer fees that the uh, tax collector is in charge of, of collecting as well, uh, delinquent, delinquent property taxes as well as um, this year. And I'm, as as happens uh, every two or three years, uh, there's a tax sale that, that happens. So when, when you have uh, property owners who owe uh, multiple years of taxes, uh, a tax sale process takes place uh, to try to uh, incentivize property owners to, uh, to pay and we become current on their tax bills. And so that's actually, uh, the, the process has started and, and uh, uh, notices will be going out uh, and not too long in the next few weeks uh, to notify uh, homeowners and property owners who do owe taxes. I know sheets and uh, Okay, purchasing. Uh, Sharon Connors is the uh, purchasing agent for the city of Norwalk. So one of the one of the so all all of the um, purchases go through the purchasing department, and uh, she is tasked. Her department is tasked with uh, making sure that any of those purchases happen within the town policies and also within uh, the parameters of state statute. And you you know you hear about contractors and uh, bids and RFPs, requests for proposals, um, and public bidding statutes. 
these are all the things that uh, that her department is in charge of and being sure that all of those, there are a lot of different steps from making sure that uh, each one of those, uh, each one of those bids, if we need a vendor for a certain service, it's following that process. And um, there are different thresholds uh, for uh, different types of uh, bidding and quotes that are needed. Um, I won't get into all the detail on that, but uh, we are in the process right now of actually revising uh, the pro procurement procedures um, and that will be coming before the, the council, uh, I believe, in the next meeting. Uh, information technology. As you can imagine, hardware, software, network needs are, um, are, are pretty big in the city. Um, and so Joyce Liu, who is the uh, director of IT for the, for the city, is in charge of that. Uh, so it's not just maintaining, uh, you know, maintaining the network and also uh, making sure that they're providing support for hardware, software, but also, you know, making sure that any of the purchases of hardware, uh, computers get outdated, uh, seems quicker and quicker and making sure that they're, um, there's a cycle of purchasing for, uh, for computers and other technology that happens on a, on a regular basis. Uh, in addition, her staff is uh, equipped to create applications, so they do some application development um, for different smaller projects within the town. Um, so it could be a database that they want to make available to department heads um, throughout the network, and so they can create that kind of database. Uh, it could be, uh, and in some cases, we may, we may need something more robust and have to go out to a third party vendor, uh, find a third party vendor. And so Joyce will often take the lead on that and make sure that the whatever the technology is of the third party vendor uh, is in sync with what we're doing. It's gonna uh, work well over our network and work, work well with the uh, software and hardware that we have in place. Move on to the comptroller's office. Uh, Chitsme Lam is the comptroller. Uh, through her her office, all uh, all transactions, all financial tra transactions happen. Um, accounts payable, accounts receivable, uh, payroll, everything goes through there. Uh, her office is also tasked with one uh, gigantic project that happens every year, which is the our annual financial report. And so we have to, uh, by law, we're required to hire a, uh, an external auditor. Uh, and uh, it's a, a months long process that really starts in about August and takes us through to uh, July, August, takes us through to December. Um, and that, that report has to get filed at the end of December. Um, so that's a major undertaking in, it, in addition to the uh, day-to-day -day processing of transactions, um, as well as, although it's not a, um, a board that we are specifically assigned to, we do play, uh, both Chisme and I play a role in the uh, pension board. Um, she, from the aspect of making sure that the, uh, the proper investments are made, um, per the instruction of, of the board, of the uh, pension board. So investments into the pension fund, that those uh, investments are made properly and to make sure that the uh, the cash is within the investment fund so that when, uh, when retirees retire and they're looking for their pension checks, that the, the funding is there to, the cash is there to be able to provide those, uh, the pensioners with their checks. Uh, management and budgets. Uh, this is Tom Ellis, um, who is the director of management and budgets. Uh, he has one, one, well, two projects really. Um, one is the budget, and that's you know sounds like it's a it's an easy thing, but it's really uh, it's a ten, it's really a ten month project. Almost as soon as you uh, finish adopting the budget, you start looking at uh, different changes in in assumptions and. You know what's happening in different markets that could affect the budget, and 
for the for the next budget. So what's in place right now, we're at, we're at the end of FY24. The budget has been adopted for FY25, and uh, very soon we'll start working on uh, the FY26 budget. Um, so it's it's budget development. It's doing analysis. Uh, Tom is, is very involved and heads up the uh, capital plan uh, as well. Uh, so uh, any of the investments that the that the town makes in uh, infrastructure, buildings, uh, roads, bridges, uh, all of those larger purchases um, for the you know last multiple years, they all run through the capital plan. And so that's another aspect of what uh, what Tom does. The the final version uh, or the 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 ultimate project yeah, product is the budget book which will uh, probably be completed in the next couple of weeks. Uh, the, and, and his main uh, connection with one of the boards is the uh, Board of Estimate and Taxation. Uh, and the Board of Estimate and Taxation, they adopt the budget, uh, they levy taxes, they adopt the mill rate, uh, you know, they approve special appropriations throughout the year. So if there's an emergency that, that pops up where uh, something was not included in the budget or there's a capital expenditure that needs to happen, then the uh, Board of Estimate and Taxation is usually the first stop for that. Um, and, you know, they, they set the, uh, the budget amount, the budget line items within the, uh, the ceiling, uh, the cap that's put in place by the Common Council. They are also in charge of uh, hiring, picking the uh, external auditor that I mentioned earlier for the uh, for the control. Uh, last, last but not least, is risk management. Um, our risk manager is uh, Craig Schmidt. No relationship to me, um, and uh, we actually spell our last names differently. Um, but the uh, risk manager is in charge of. Uh, managing the risk, which which entails uh, training staff, making sure that uh, uh, you know that they're they're following the right protocols to um, avoid any kinds of slip up accidents um, that could end up costing the town money. Um, so he's, uh, the risk manager is uh, heavily involved with insurance. Um, working with underwriters, working with insurance brokers and our insurance consultant who advise us on uh, the various insurance policies. A uh, couple, at least um, in Fairfield, where I was two or three years ago, cyber insurance was a big a big issue. And, um, and, and so uh, it, it was something that, uh, that the towns had to put into place. Um, and so that there, we have that happen uh, every once in a while where you get a new line of insurance that uh, pops up or may be needed um, that has to be analyzed and, uh, and determined whether or not it's something that we uh, should be investing in and, and it's worth, uh, worth in, uh, putting our money into uh, for insurance purposes. And that is, those are all of my uh, departments and my team. And I'm, I'm happy to take any questions if anybody has any questions. Yes. If you would just kind of explain the boards that um, impact what you do. Sure. I, and I, I mentioned them briefly. The Board of Assessment Appeals is um, is who the assessor works with. Uh, there are three members of that board. They're in a real, during a, um, and there's three members and then three alternates. Um, they're in a reval year, which just happened. Um, you could add up to up to seven members of that board, but they're, you know, it, it's a, a very important function because they have, uh, we had 747 appeals and there's a very tight timeline to get through all those. So you can imagine 
uh, people coming through and and saying, hey, you know, my my house, you have it for in here for a million dollars. I don't think it's worth that much. Maybe it's nine hundred thousand. You have to go through and make a judgment about what, um, you know, whether or not you think that that valuation should be reduced as a board member. Um, so it's an important role and it's it's very timely because all of these all the functions of what they do, kind of the the end point of that is, all right, we need to uh, we need to send out tax bills. So ever that's the that's that's where you have to get to. But there are a number of steps that have to happen in between when the valuation when the uh, reval is done, and that point uh, there's a number of steps that, that have to be done statutorily. And so um, there's there's actually during a a reval year there's not a lot of time to get that done, and so these positions on, on that board are super important. Uh, okay, and the other one was the uh, Board of Estimate and Taxation uh, that I mentioned. And uh, uh, again, a, a very important uh, because they're, they're determining uh, in a lot of ways the direction of the budget um, and and you know, in some cases, specific line items of the budget, they have that kind of authority. Uh, they're appointing the external auditor. Uh, in addition to, uh, they, there are some uh, special appropriations that are done, but in addition, there are transfers that need to happen throughout the year. So if uh, we have an account that, we know there's an account in the budget that's gonna be over budget, we can, move move money around from one not nefariously move money around from one account to the to another um as long as we stay within the overall budget um uh to make sure that that it is uh balanced and uh doesn't exceed the cap that's set by the common council um but there are there are six appointed members of that board they're appointed by the mayor uh, there is a, in this case, with that entity, there's a, a minimum minority party. Uh, so you, there there can't be more than three people from any one party. Um, so you, you're you know, ensured that there is a diversity of, of opinions or uh, diversity of perspectives when it comes to developing the budget. And then the, uh, the mayor himself is an ex officio member of the board. So those are the two that uh, that we work closely with. In addition, I mentioned the, the pension board as well, uh, which uh, technically falls under HR, but we we do have a lot of uh, interest in that and uh, and role in that. Question. Yes. So if people really want to get engaged in either of these, um, what kind of skill set would be helpful? Um, what might preclude somebody a conflict of interest and are you looking for any more people those three things so the right now the uh again there was a there was a big need in the board of assessment appeals um leading up to the and after the revaluation but i know that they did um they did get enough uh enough people in there to be able to get everything done and get it done on time um, and so now, next so next year when this happens again, um, I would I, I don't know what the what the official process is for applying to to that board, but certainly uh, going online and, uh, uh, and to each of the boards, and you would find information about how to apply. With regard to the uh, board of assessment appeals, the uh, a lot of their where, well, their work has has been completed, and it'll start up again. They they kind of uh, start up every every year. So, I believe around the end of January, beginning of, of February is when they start the bulk of their work. As I mentioned, there were 747 uh, appeals applications. Next year, that'll drop down uh, a lot uh, because it's not a revaluation year. So, uh, I you know I think a typical amount that we see is between 100, 200 uh, appeals, not, not 747. Um, so if someone's interested in that, I would say between now, January, 
of next year to, uh, you know, it's something to start looking into. I'm not aware of any, uh, I don't know if there are actually uh, criteria for being a member of the BAA. I know obviously it's, it's good to have uh, background and knowledge um, related to real estate and real estate valuation and property valuation. Those are obviously helpful things to, to have. Um, but I'm not aware of any uh, any statutory or other um, uh, other authorities that would require you to have certain experience. Um, and same thing for the um, board of investment taxation. Uh, it's it's great to have have some background in budgeting, uh, business background, investment. Uh, uh, he, to a certain extent, I think there are some attorneys on there that can that can be helpful in certain circumstances. Uh, so yeah, you can you can uh, imagine what goes into the, the development of a budget, and uh, if you like numbers, it's it, it can be a good uh, you know those can be good skills to have. Uh, but no, there's no uh, specific requirements or prerequisites for. Uh, for people to have in order to be on the board. I have two questions. Um, that number you threw up before about how many appeals we got out of how many properties is that approximately? Cool. There you go. That's a lot of properties. Um, yeah. Secondly, um, a friend and I were wondering why IT is grouped under finance. What's the logic behind that? Yeah, it's a good question. I know uh, the only thing I can say is that I know that in other um, other cities do the same way, and, um, and and it's not uncommon. When I was in Fairfield, they did the same thing. IT was under the under the finance director there as well. Um, I I think a lot of it has to do with uh, you know you can find efficiencies uh, through IT and, and can have an impact on budget. Uh, it's it's you know he heavily involved in the operation of the town, um, and so uh, that that would be I think a a big reason for it is that it's kind of it's one of those departments that spans all other departments and the needs of all other departments, kind of like in HR. Although HR is not under under the uh, the finance department, I think for other reasons, but it does have the. Um, it has those functions and those duties that that span all the other departments. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Right, we survived the numbers part. Everybody loves the numbers and we, like we said, the budget spans 10 months. So um, we're always thinking about the budget and always trying to figure out where things belong and how they belong there. We're so happy that Jared came um, to us from Fairfield. Uh, he's been working really well with all the teams and we're just, this uh, budget season was really um, a lot smoother maybe than other past budget processes. So um, I do want to, um, I do want to make a really quick distinction because um some of the language that we're going to use is committee versus commission. And so if we're talking about a committee, a committee is a common council committee where common council members divide off into teams that focus on specific topic areas that work directly with the chiefs to put through approvals for items that will go to common council for approval. And a lot of those have to do with policies, but a lot of them are contractual or um, different finance discussions. And so if you hear the word committee, that relates to common council folks. Um, if you hear the word commission, that's the volunteer. Those are the volunteer groups. So they're a little bit different. Um, and sometimes we use them interchangeably because we're just so used to talking about them. But I just, I wanted to make that distinction for, for you just so that you you know um, what's available to, to participate in and, and what would be a common council so from here, we want to um, actually go to Public Works, um, and Vanessa Valadere is, is um, joining us via Zoom, um, and she's going to be able to present on all of the teams that make up the Public Works Department. Vanessa, are you able to unmute? I am. Can you guys hear me? Great. Yep. 
Okay, perfect. Yes, um, to, so, do you need me to advance your slides for you? Oh, if you can do that, will be great. Thank you. Okay. So, thank you, everyone. Uh, Vanessa Valadares, I'm the Chief of Operations and Public Works. And first, I want to apologize that I'm not there in person. Unfortunately, I had a family emergency and I had to fly to the other side of the country, but um, now things are more under control and I should be back in Connecticut, hopefully tomorrow night. So I'm sorry that I'm missing interact with you guys in person. Um, so what is Public Works? Um, so Public Works, we are actually, we have five departments under us and um, our mission is really to provide the safest and the most effective operation for the city of Norwalk by delivering the most efficient maintenance, repair, and capital improvement of city infrastructure and parks in the best, courteous, professional, and citizen-responsive manner. So pretty much we're the backbone of the city. Um, the only thing that is different than from different public works is that when Jessica mentioned in 2019 that we have that reorganization, uh, recreation and parks ended up being coming under uh, public works as well. So I'm going to go step by step and explain what all the different departments are responsible for. Uh, so the first one that we have is engineering, who is responsible for engineering is Jim Mian. He's our principal engineer. And pretty much what engineering does is they take care of the major infrastructure of the capital projects of the city. So it's not the small maintenance, so it's not the potholes, but it will be when we need to pave roads, uh, repair sidewalks or upgrade sidewalks. When I mean repair is on a, a big scale. Um, so when we do bridges, uh, we do people, why do we get a lot of complaints about flooding? We're responsible for all the drainage. Um, what And other things that we do on engineering besides all that infrastructure is also we, are, we give other departments uh, a lot of engineering help on their own projects as well. So for instance, if um, in case of parks, although parks is under the same umbrella, now engineering oversees all the parks capital improvements as well. So if we're gonna uh, do a pickleball or a baseball court, usually engineer gets involved. Besides that, everyone that works on the right of way needs an encroachment permit. So if you're gonna tap to a new sewer line, if you need to do, if the water company needs to upgrade the water main, and if they're working on the right of way, they need a permit from us. Um, so anyone that is working on the middle of the road came to engineering for a permit, inclusive if you need a driveway. Um, why the driveway? Because the driveway finish on the road and usually between the end of your property and the road, it is what we call the apron of that driveway, and that's already on the right of way. Um, so this is pretty much what engineering does, and also we do plan review. So if you're coming for a plan review through the city, your gateway is usually through planning and zoning, and then they're going to send you your drawings to us. And what we are checking under engineering is if you're um, meeting our standards and also our drainage manual. So one thing that I want to emphasize on engineering um, is if you have any problems in the city, you should definitely let us know. You know, we love to hear the complaints. The complaints is what make us get the work done. And how we prioritize the work that needs to be done is based on the feedback that we receive. So if you have issues about flooding, you have to let us know. Um, if you have potholes on your street, you have to let us know. If your garbage hasn't been picked up, you have to let us know. And how do you do that? Calling customer service. The number is 203-854-3200. And we do have a very good system that we can log every single call that we receive. And sometimes we go back to figure it out, okay, on this street, how many complaints have we got? Why is this street flooding when we just have a very small uh, rain event? So all that help us a lot. So I just want to uh, let you guys know. And I know that um, I believe that Eileen mentioned that you, there's a lot of high schoolers in the audience. Uh, if you guys want to become an engineer, 
you can come back to us. Also, we offer internships for uh, interns in the summer. So usually on, in our engineering department, every summer we hire five uh, engineer interns for uh, the summer to help us with our paving and bridge projects. So my next department, um, I believe that uh, what I have, just so you might move my slide, is operations. So operations is really uh, amazing because they are the guys that clean the snow. We have uh, 26 routes. Um, it's also fleet because we take care of all the city cars with the exception of the fire, but we do take care of the police cars as well. We do all the street sweeping. We, we also check our storm drainage. We clean up the catch basins. Um, and also our solid waste and our transfer station is all under operations. Um, and there is also some tree cleaning uh, and trimming and some removal um, happening under operations. Um, so this, if it is everything related to the city that is more on the maintenance part, usually falls under operations. And uh, Chris Store is the superintendent of it. Uh, my next one is, I believe, building management. Building management, um, to be honest, the residents do not interface as much with them uh, because this is uh, the behind the scenes work. Um, as the name says, it takes care of the city building. So usually any carpentry, electrical work, uh, janitorial, plumbing that is on public buildings, um, more of the, for instance, city hall, um, is our building management that will do. We do not do the maintenance of the schools. That is not under public works. That it will be under the Board of Ed. Uh, but building management really takes care of uh, our main building facilities. Um, so another thing that I want to talk about it, um, I believe that, Jessica, if you don't mind, go up. I just want to see how we, oh, yeah. So that's, no, if you go back. One. Thank you. So we have our committees and commissions. So we, as Jessica explained, we have one committee that is our public works committee that is part of the common council that they oversee all the operations of uh, and approvals for engineering and mostly operations projects. Uh, but we do have a uh, two committees that you guys can be involved. One is our tree advisory committee that although it's a committee, it is not made of common council people. Um, so we call tech. And what that committee does, it help us decide um, areas where we're gonna do planting throughout the city. Also, as part of the tree advisory committee, uh, now we ha we just hire an arborist that is part of our team, and we're trying to really increase the tree canopy throughout the city. Um, and one way that we would like to do that is creating some liaisons for tree planting in neighborhoods. So that is another, if you guys uh, would like to participate, just let me know. Uh, you guys can always reach out to me and then I'll, I'll direct you the right person. But we are trying to create uh, in the neighborhoods liaison people so we, you can tell us where we should be planting those trees. So for those that want to uh, volunteer, there is really no um, necessary requirements to be a part of the tree advisory committee. Of course, you should be like uh, aligned with planting the trees and all that. But this is a good one uh, for a volunteer. We usually. I believe that the committee has five uh, members and they are appointed by the mayor. So another division under public works is the Water Pollution Control Authority is also known as the WPCA. The WPCA is an enterprise fund that was created in 2000 and what they do is they oversee all the sewage system for the city of North that includes not only the collection system, but also the wastewater treatment plan. So um, we have over 205 miles of pipes. We have 22 pumping stations and we 
treat about 18 million gallon per day um, at the, our treatment plant. Uh, the water pollution control also has a board that is the WPCA board, and this is not a, a committee. So that's also another that we, we have residents that uh, are appointed to that board. Yeah, that's the explanation about uh, the board. And um, the last division that I have under me is recreational and parks that, as I mentioned, that's the latest that uh, was part of the WPs, I'm, I'm sorry, as part of the GPW. And recreation and parks, I know that everyone is familiar with it. So the parks, we pretty much oversee and maintain all the parks in the city. Uh, and besides that, we do all the recreational work related to it. So we summer camps now, uh, after school, uh, some events like the 4th of July, um, all that it falls under recreation and parks. The director is Rob Stowers. Uh, we actually stole him from Seattle. He, he has over three years of experience as director of recreation and parks. And we have be, really been increasing uh, all the activities that we have been doing. And last year, we finalized the Recs and Parks Master Plan. What will help us really focus on what the public needs and how we can improve even better um, the parks for use for the citizens. Um, the Recreation and Parks does have also a, a committee and that is appointed by the mayor and that is the Recreation, Parks and Cultural Affairs Committee. And what they do is they also approve new program initiatives, special events, if you're gonna have a if you're gonna have an event in the city, let's say if it is a race, if they are proposing a race, they and it's will use one of the our parks has to be approved through them, and also uh, the recreation and parks works very close to other groups throughout the city. So besides the leagues, we have also a lot of sports leagues that use our facilities. So for instance, for baseball, soccer, uh, basketball. And there are also other type of uh, small groups that recreation and parks works very close. So for instance, Friends of Cranberry Park, Friends of Woods Pond, um, Norwalk Friends of Norwalk Dogs. So all those little volunteers, small groups throughout the city interacts a lot with recreation and parks. So we can um, work hand to hand to try to understand what the neighborhood wants and what that special group wants and what we can do to improve. Um, so I believe that with that, that's probably my last slide and I'm open to any questions. I just have a quick question. You did say paid interns, did you say that? Yes, for if you're in college, it's a paid internship. For high school, it is not. Okay, and what about graduated from college? <laughs> yes, right. yes, okay. yes, yeah. So I'll, I'll tell you how it works. So, but you have to be, you have to be in engineering course. Uh, the best uh, time to apply, you have to, uh, yeah, because that's for the engineering department. So um, usually we start looking for engineers for the summer around February. So we start uh, looking at to all our, send us the resumes if they're interested in interning with us. And we'll, we get all the resumes together and we start the process between late February throughout March. Vanessa, do you know offhand what the pay is for that internship? $18 an hour. Great. Thank you, Vanessa. Thanks for joining us from Seattle. We miss you and we'll see you next week. Yes. Thank you so much, guys. I, I appreciate it. Thanks for changing the order. Have a good yeah. one. No problem at all. All right. Lamont Daniels up next. Here we go. Community and social services. So, um, uh... I'm going to move quickly. Um, I just want to draw attention to this wonderful 
a document that Jessica put together because it, it lists everything. So I'm not going to go over it, um, but you can see the different departments. But I do have a couple of things that I do want to highlight. My name is Lamont Daniels. I serve as the chief of community services. Like Jessica, uh, we are the inaugural cabinet for the city of Norwalk over the past five years. Okay, good. Um, I'm just so excited to be here. I enjoy what I do. I call the departments that I supervise the heartbeat of the city. Why? Because we focus on the 91,000 residents, your well-being. So I do have some, I like to prepare remarks so I can stay focused because I could talk all day. Um, this is the team, myself, Deanna Diamora, who is our, what I call our fearless health director. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, three, two years ago when COVID impacted the world. I think people had a sense of, oh, that's what the health department does. Uh, the, the, uh, the health department rose to the occasion and ensure that um, that we were safe. We, we learned what was going on and they do a, a few other, a lot of, a few other things I'll talk about. Anna Vivian Estrella is our human services director. As Jessica pointed out, this is one of those new positions under the restructuring. So five years ago, there was not a human services director. Five years ago, there was not a human services department. I'll talk about that. There was a social services department many years ago, but the city has um, lapsed that service and really we really look to the nonprofit community to do the heavy lifting. But I'll share with you over the past five years what our role and specifically what your taxpayers are paying for as we talk about how is the city showing up and helping the 91,000 residents that call Norwalk home. And then Sherelle Harris, our library director. And, and make a note, you know, because this was something new to me. Um, and, and when I talk to residents, some residents know, some residents don't know. There are actually four libraries in the city of Norwalk. Uh, we I see Lori, one of our managers here uh, and colleagues here. So shout out to Lori. Um, there's four, but there's two that are municipally run or led and funded. Uh, and that's the library on Maine and the South Norwalk branch on Washington. Okay. So the mission of the, I'll read this because I like it, uh, is to increase and sustain the social well-being and health of all Norwalk residents. The community service provides oversight and administrative support to departments. We unify initiatives and programs that directly affect the social well-being and health of all residents and support the quality of life through the lifespan. And so I'll talk about the, uh, the, uh, the three departments. So the health department is one of the few accredited health departments in Connecticut. They provide a variety of services and you see them here listed. Uh, and fulfill its mission to prevent and control the spread of disease, promote a healthy environment, and protect the quality of life within a changing community. This department oversees several boards, and they are the Board of Health, which is a six-member board appointed and approved by the Common Council. Uh, the Board of Health oversees the public health initiatives. It is the governing body that sets policy and practices. And, 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 and I want to kind of connect it to uh, what the council was saying that, you know, you don't have to be a public health expert, but it definitely helps to have knowledge. I mean, it's, it's, it's like on the job training, but we do have physicians, nurses that serve on the board because we do talk about and they do help us set the strategy for public health for our city. The second one is the Shellfish Commission. Uh, we are a waterfront community like many other towns at Fairfield County. That is a five member board. And this board manages and protects the local shell, shellfish resources right here in our beautiful city, uh, ensuring the sustainable harvesting practices to preserve these valuable natural resources. So there's a local oversight by um, local ordinance, and then there's the state DEP and environment. So they work hand in hand to make sure uh, the quality of life in our environment, particularly our shellfish, are uh, maintained. And then also... Um, you know, I was talking with Dan earlier, just managing of how it's used, if there's destruction, water quality, and damn, this is the oversight body that oversees that. And then lastly, under the health department is the uh, the mayor's water quality committee. This is an 11 board uh, committee, uh, commission committee, right? This is all in volunteer. So these are the ones that you all can uh, volunteer on. Uh, this committee focuses on addressing water quality issues with our, within, within our community, 
they collaborate again with many stakeholders. When you, you know, we talk about the beach has to close because this is this commission works with the health department. And I want to say that all three of these boards are over um, are facilitated by a health department practitioner, by a staff member. So there's the volunteer board with a, 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 a health department expert person that help facilitate. And these are all uh, meetings to, uh, that you all can uh, uh, look to. The second one is our human services department. Um, human service department, to, as Jessica pointed out, some of these departments already exist. So youth services, we combine youth services, early childhood, fair rent, and human relations. I'll talk about that. Uh, what is new is our community resource hub and our family navigation. And uh, the families, uh, the, excuse me, the human services department works in partnership with all the community organizations here in the city. We bring them together, we coalesce, and we coordinate. Uh, services, a community resource hub, and I want to just do a little shout out, is your local community resource hub. So this is specifically designed while the city of Norwalk does not provide direct social service, we rely on the nonprofit community in upstairs on room 202, uh, excuse me, yeah, yeah, room 202, the community resource hub is a resource for all residents to use to say, hey, I want to know what's available in my town. You know, where do I go for help for this? Or what resources are here for that? Or how can I get help for my elderly parent? How can I get help for myself? And that's right upstairs. So that's a new service over the past, over, over the past five years under Mayor Will's administration um, that we that we created. And again, I want to thank the uh, Common Council for approving this. And so that number is 203-854-7999. For example, if you want to learn more about, can, can you tell me more about the engineer program? You can call that 854-799 number and they'll help navigate and help you figure out what those services and what those resources are. So we're very proud of that. Now under the human services department, there are two departments. Uh, there are three uh, commissions and I'll speak to those. One is the Fair Rent Commission. Uh, this was one of our oldest commissions. Uh, it started back in the uh, late 70s, but just recently in 2022, the state now has mandated that every town and city in our state, if you have a population of over 25,000, you have to have a fair rent commission. But Noah Walk was already ahead of the curve. We've had this commission for many, many years. And while we don't have rent control, this commission, again, volunteers, this is, I was already recruiting some folks. You want to be on the fair rent commission? Because <laughs> there are vacancies. Uh, this commission um, looks at uh, residents, tenants can file a complaint uh, to really say, hey, I think my my rent is being is high. Can you look at that? Or I, I'm okay with paying my rent, but there's things I think the uh, the the uh, the landlord needs to do. So this is a governing body uh, made up of folks like yourselves that has to be appointed and approved by the mayor. Um, we have a staff person that facilitate it, facilitates it. We have a, a le an attorney that facilitates it as well. You don't have to be an expert, but you know I'll say that I think it's just common sense. There is a procedure and protocol that you have to follow. So you can't just arbitrarily say, I think it's too high. No, there's a process that you're guided through. And if there's a hearing, there's a process that you have to go through. So I think it's common sense. People that um, that is inter interested in kind of looking at how that works uh, will walk them. And as I said, there are... Um, uh, there are some vacancies. There's seven members voting, and then we have also seven alternates because, because it moves so fast. We want to make sure we always have a quorum because you're talking about people's lives. So, you know, when you don't have a quorum, that means another month has gone by where that resident has to figure out, you know, what's going on. Uh, next one is the Fair Housing Advisory Commission. I just put that under uh, under human, human services, although we don't directly supervise it. Uh, back in the 80s, there was a consent degree, a lawsuit uh, that was a uh, 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 move that was uh, introduced uh, by the NAACP, the Greater Norwalk NAACP, when in the 80s there were some, you know, you know, things going not going right. So there's a consent decree that created this specific commission. So it has its own governing guidelines. For example, the mayor can appoint two to this commission. This is an eight member, but also the NAACP has a seat. Um, uh, did I write it all down? It's, it's in your paperwork, <laughs> but the mayor can appoint too. But there's a governor's there's, there's because it, because it was a consent degree by law, it specifies who can be on the committee. So the mayor has two seats, NAACP, then it has to be uh, another person. But again, the mayor can appoint too. 
And then lastly is the Human Relations Commission. Um, this, this commission has been um, retired in the moment. For those of you that have, have watched and monitored what's going on in the city, you know, we hired a DE officer. We're trying to figure out what to do next. Uh, we have the Women's Commission. So how does that connect with this? So this is a commission that uh, internally the administration is figuring out, you know, where do we go with this commission? It, it definitely had its work. Uh, the CHRO is, is, has grown, has expanded. So when members have any diversity or equity or, or you know, issues around race and discrimination, we do encourage them or do um, uh, refer them to the CHRO State Commission, which kind of served the same purpose. But in, in this case, we, we make the referrals there. So the service is not gone, it's just not done locally at this point. And then lastly, uh, our wonderful, wonderful library system. And I want to put a plug that uh, next week we have our re-grand opening for the first floor of the South Norwalk Library. Sheila Harris has done an amazing job. It is really, 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 really nice. Uh, so please go visit your library. And so again, Maine and South Norwalk is under the city, the city of Norwalk's jurisdiction. Um, and the library does an amazing job. And there's a library board. And that's another one that there's, there's a state, um, there's a, a, a local ordinance that also governs that particular board. So under human, under uh, the library, uh, the mayor has, um, and I wrote it down, I think the mayor has five, th this board is, so two are mayor, I'm sorry, no, five, so five members for, for the library board, uh, five the, mem the mayor can appoint, again, approved by common council. And then um, because it's in the first taxing district, uh, this, um, the first taxing district, also can appoint uh, two members. And the second taxing district also by ordinance uh, can appoint. So this is a nine member board, uh, but five are appointed by the mayor approved by common council. And then the two, the, the four additional seats are appointed by the taxing district. And this board sets policy. Uh, this board is one of, is, is the advocate for the city's library system. Um, I just wanna say um, these boards and commissions um, or comprised of individuals such as yourselves who volunteer their time and expertise to uh, serve our community and their contributions are invaluable. I also just want to just give a shout out to the staff that uh, manages these commissions. They're, they're held at night, um, day in and day out, and help prepare the, uh, the agendas and work with the chairs of each respective commissions. Uh, and I'll take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. It's um, a little bit less of a question. Um, actually, my name is Christina Testabuzzi, and I'm actually the chair of the Commission of the Status of Women, which I'm sure this will be updated to include. So thank you. So, right, because we, we, I don't know, where, where does it sit? I mean, right, that's where, right, right, we, right, right exactly. You're absolutely right. <laughs> so, I, so that's great. And, and the commission is also, um, is very much engaged with helping when there's an issue that we identify. So I just wanted to just acknowledge if I could. Absolutely. Um, only just because um, there are some folks here. The commission um, on the status of women, we've actually helped advocate and helped get the online commission form across the board. Awesome. Right. So we noticed the problem, we wanted to help address it. Um, we helped establish an impact award, which identified uh, an adult and a youth in our community for their impact on gender equity. We did a um, pretty significant uh, presentation to the mayor and his team about a year ago on diversification of boards and commissions. Um, and that's gotten a lot of traction and support. Absolutely. Um, some action. We've also are piloting a mentorship program for our commission that we hope to roll out to some of the other commissions um, because we felt that if we're opening our doors and making sure we have a very broad representation, we don't want to take for granted that everyone knows what it means to be involved in a commission as a volunteer. And we also recently, I know the Parks and Rec master plan was met with, was um, mentioned. We actually did a lot of work um, to meet with Robert to discuss looking at that master plan through a gender equity lens. And I know that also took some, uh, some traction. Wonderful. So all of these things impact all of our communities and um, being that the commission, since I'm here, Michelle. The Absolutely. Staff member, <laughs> I did want to indeed mention that and thank you. As a Norwalker who grew up and actually did youth leadership programs in this room, this is exciting to see, and I hope we can get more involved. In awesome. Future. So I think I was already pointed out all the commissions are appointed online. Um, you can call me directly, say, hey, Lamont, I would like to learn more about that. I would gladly assist you. Oh, we are recruiting again for the Fair Rent Commission. I do have some vacancies, and I'll take your call, and uh, we'll figure out what's the best way. Are there any questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.
Thanks, Salon. Thank you. And thank you very much for pointing that out. There's also another one that I noticed was missing that we'll, Steve and I will talk about. But um, thanks, Salon and Deputy Chief Blake. Come on up. Good evening, everyone. My name is Terry Blake. I'm one of the Deputy Police Chiefs here for uh, your police department. Um, as you can see, uh, Chief Walsh is our police chief. I am one of the one of the deputy chiefs, along with uh, Joseph Dinho and Melissa Lepore. Our mission statement um, is, uh, you know, it's more than just words to us. It's kind of how we how we operate. It is what we instill in our officers, and I think what is expected of the community that we serve. Um, if you'll just uh, give me a minute here, it's to provide quality service to a diverse community through a culture of bias-free policing, to hire and promote talented officers and a professional staff with the courage and desire to serve and protect our community, and to promote a cooperative spirit in which police officers and citizens work together to promote a safe environment. It is that work that we do together that keeps this community safe. Our police commission is uh, made up of the mayor and his appointees. There's four with five, five total police commissioners, two represent the Democratic Party and two represent the Republican Party. Uh, all those commission spots are filled and they again are appointed by the mayor. So if anyone was interested uh, in that, that goes through the mayor's office. And again, I think much like everyone else has talked about, it's just a, it's a willingness to serve. Willingness to serve your community is re really what being on a commission or being on uh, a subcommittee um, is really what it's all about. This, this city does a great job. There's so many people involved in this community on our committees and commissions that it's really a uh, huge positive for the city. Um, any additional information you might be looking for is available at norwalkpd.com. There's a tremendous amount of information about the police department. Our 2023 annual report was recently published on there and that will tell you um, a tremendous amount. It's very transparent, lets you know all about the police department and what's going on over there. Certainly happy to take any questions, but I don't want to take up any more of your time. So the, the mayor, uh, the mayor has the authority to appoint four city residents uh, as police commissioners. You're welcome. All right. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Deputy Chief Blake. Um, so if you're interested, then you would want to send your resume to the mayor's office, or you can connect with any one of us and we will introduce you to the person who um, takes the resumes in at the mayor's office and uh, helps for that those appointments to happen. Right. All right, last but definitely not least, here we go, economic and community development. So like I said, um, five years ago, the economic community development department did not exist. Um, we actually had an economic development director who was out of the redevelopment agency um, and that position moved over to city hall. And at that particular point in time, the mayor brought together um, all of these different teams. Steve Kleppen is our director of planning and zoning. Jim Travers is our director of transportation, mobility and parking. Uh, Bill Ireland is our chief building official and Sabrina Gadeski is our director of business development and tourism. Um, Bill's been with the city for over 30 years. Steve's been with the city for eight years. Um, and Sabrina and I have been with the city for five years. Jim's been with the city for about three and a half years. So collectively, um, lots of experience here. And uh, as you can see, it's a big, 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 big scope as far as topics go. And the reason for that is because we focus on the quality of life. And the reason why the scope is so big is because the quality of life is different for everybody, right? Everybody is focused on something different and what makes a community special to everybody is, is very unique. And um, I had a really great experience just a couple of weeks ago. My two year, my three-year-old daughter asked me what my job is um, for the mayor, which mom, what do you do for work? And I said, you know, my job is to help everybody love Norwalk as much as we do, right? And so that's really how we encompass economic and community development, regardless of how it's being looked at. And we have the unique experience of not only working with residents, but we also work with the businesses to be able to make that happen. And part of Jim Travers' job through transportation, mobility, and parking is to make the connectivity happen between the residential and the commercial areas in order to be able to make the city flow and be as safe as it can possibly be. So we're just going to get into um, the departments. I'm going to be presenting a few and Steve's going to take on planning and zoning. 
But when it comes to building in code enforcement, you know, the department is so incredibly uh, crucial to the health and safety of the residents and the businesses in the city of Norwalk. We actually process um, almost 2,000 permits each and every year. Um, and that doesn't include the things that come over the desk that don't require a permit that we go out and we inspect and we look at and we make sure that our health and safety are there. Um, we do that through a number of different statutes and regulations that are in place. And one of those is the Connecticut Building and Code um, regulation that we that guides our work. But in addition to this, each of the teams that you've heard speak today, we also have local ordinances and those local ordinances help guide at the local level what some of those state regulations do, right? And so the way in which we work with residents, um, whether it be complaints on blight or whether we work through permitting and health and safety, we do that within those swim lanes of what the state offers us. And then we at the local level adopt an ordinance to be able to make that happen. And what's interesting is all of the things that you're learning about today, as far as commissions go, all of those commissions are in place because they are part of a local ordinance. And that local ordinance says who should be on the committee and what the responsibilities of that committee are and are not, um, and how those committees come together. And so if you're looking for more background information, that's one way to find it. Um, more than anything, um, this department really is um, kind of the makes is the really the grease on the tracks that makes the city work regardless of it being new development or residential remodeling whether someone's putting a pool in or a generator in whether a storefront is being worked on whether a new development is going in um, around the train station and so this department is really important we have two uh, we have two groups, um, two commissions that, that work with building and code. One of them is the blight citation hearings. It's actually an independent hearing officer that hears um, appeals on blight violations. And the second is the building board of appeals, which works really closely with um, thinking about materials and, and the way in which the buildings uh, are built. And that is if the permit is actually appealed or if we deny the permit and someone wants to come in and talk about it. Um, the other thing that is unrelated to this, just because I didn't, I didn't include it in the deck because it's actually a committee as opposed to a commission, but we do have an economic development committee, economic and community development committee. And that then, um, as I was saying, has all of the common council folks and um, council person Josh Goldstein is actually our chair for economic and community development. Um, and so that's where you can learn more and speak more and do participate in public hearing on the specific initiatives that we actually work on through economic and community development. The second group that's actually within our team is business development and tourism. And this this office also didn't exist five years ago, which is really amazing. Um, we've worked with so many businesses across the city, big, small, medium, um, selling boutique cookie baking and ice cream making up to um, thinking about um the Pepperidge Farm uh, leaving and trying to be able to utilize that particular building and try to bring in a business that can bring jobs in. Um, and so Sabrina Gadeski is our director. She works with businesses trying to retain them or grow them or welcome new businesses into the city. We've been really lucky in economic and community development. The city received about $40 million of ARPA money and economic and community development was responsible for programming almost 9 million of that. And so, you know, it really speaks to how the city has changed um, the way that we see economic development and the importance of economic development. And again, that's specifically because it focuses on bringing, building very strong communities and building very strong neighborhoods that we that people want to live in and feel passionate about and feel really at home in and feel safe in. Um, and therefore um, being able to open businesses in the city to be able to help residents stay in place. Um, the Arts and Cultural Commission is a group that works directly with business development and tourism, and they do a couple of things for us. One, all of the murals that you're starting to see around the city, including the one on the Monroe underpass. Um, thank you. I love them, too. Yeah, um, though those are new to the city of Norwalk. We've had um, a lot of private murals done in the past, but this is really an initiative to do a call for artists, a national call for artists, where we have all of these great artists from all over the world coming in to be able to share their artwork with us. Um, we've accepted a couple of different sculptures. One of them is the ballerina woman who is over in the art park on West Avenue. Um, and so really addressing um, arts and cultural initiatives, including um, the state coming down, 
this Thursday to do an arts and cultural district walk with us, which is Wall Street, West Avenue, and also West Avenue, uh, also Washington Street, in order to be able to adopt an arts and cultural district will, but will allow us to be more eligible for funding and more eligible for state resources in that specific area. And the second thing that this um, commission helps us do is all of the special events. So the holiday special events that are happening in December and the Halloween special event that's happening in October, um, as well as uh, we're doing a summer event as well. We've been partnering with um, Pride. We've been partnering with um, the Arts Festival and the NICE Festival to be able to enhance some of the offerings that are there and make them um, family friendly and be able to support and add resources to those. Um, so. You know, this is a really exciting one. It's a lot of fun if you're into arts and culture and you want to help the city hold special events and really um, bring more art into into our neighborhoods. That's a really good one for you to consider. Um, and I'll pass it over to Steve for planning and zoning. Good evening, everybody. My name is Steve Plump, and as Jessica indicated, I've been with the city for about eight years now. Um, so planning and zoning department is really kind of three departments in one. Uh, actually, at different times, it was three departments. We have planning, which is kind of focusing on a long-term vision, looking at neighborhoods, looking at the community um, as a whole. You have zoning, which is more of the enforcement end, which does the permitting, and also make sure that uh, people are behaving property in terms of how they're using the land. And we also have conservation, which is comprised of inland wetlands, and also they have a function uh, where they look at open space, natural features, and trying to do planning from, from that perspective. Um, within the planning and zoning, we have um, you know, a lot of different tasks, as I mentioned. With planning, we look at the plan of conservation development, which is a longer term plan, a 10 year plan that's mandated by the state of Connecticut. We also do a lot of smaller level plans, neighborhood plannings, where we might do, we did one in East Norwalk, which is a TND plan. We did um, several economic studies, one doing looking at the industrial zones, we looked at the industrial waterfront. Right now we have two studies underway. One is an affordable housing plan, which I is the, the like the first phase of it. Draft phase is gonna hopefully come out Tuesday or Wednesday of this week. We're kind of excited by some of the things we're seeing there. Affordable housing plan, I think of it as the most exciting plan, but it's actually much more interesting than I actually anticipated. So. We're, we're coming out with the housing needs assessment uh, piece this week, which will get released out to the public and hopefully in the fall, the full report with, with recommendations will come out. And we're just starting up working with, um, with Jess carefully on a strategic harbor plan. So that's one is kind of just getting underway. And we think probably get a more rapid kickoff and rapid pace, probably about in like another month or so with that one. Um, the, you know, the, we have a lot of different boards and commissions we work with as a whole. I think we have six from, from our group. Um, the first one I'll talk about is the Zoning Board of Appeals. That is an eight member body where they have five seated members. Uh, and they have two functions. Their primary function is to, which, which takes most of their time is looking at variance applications. So if you want to put an addition on your house, but your house was built in 1920 and it's three feet from the property line and the rules have changed or your house was built before the rules are and you can't build to the code, you go to this body and they hear your application to decide whether you can uh, go forward or not. And the, the kind of tricky thing and interesting thing with that is it, to get uh, an approval on a variance is a really high bar legally to do that. And the second point is you need four approval votes out of the five members. So there's not a lot of margin for error with that. And th that's a board that anytime I get a vacancy on there, even if it's an alternate, I push to get a new member because if they're missing somebody or somebody's traveling or they're sick and you don't have the five full members, you only have four, that means there's no margin for an error with an applicant. So they can choose to go forward, but they run the risk of not getting an approval. So that's kind of a, a tough spot with those. The second thing that they do is they hear appeals on land use decisions. So if I say, sorry, I, I'm not gonna let you build that because I think you're too, it's too tall or you're doing something that's not appropriate, someone can argue that decision. Any decision I make or the zoning enforcement also would make, somebody can challenge that to the zoning board of appeals. So they would then, the, Z, the zoning board of appeals kind of acts in a de novo fashion where they're looking at things from a, from a pre fresh perspective and deciding whether staff made the correct decision or not. So that, that's the, the second function of the CBA. Um, 
We also have a zoning citation hearing process similar to the blight process where we have, we actually have two um, zoning citation hearing officers now. Those are volunteers. We try to get attorneys for those because it, it's sort of a legal proceeding. And what they're doing is they're kind of sitting in judgment of planning and zoning staff on the enforcement end. So if, if we say uh, person X is operating a contractor yard out of their property, we have to send out a notice of uh, violation that eventually if they're not gonna comply, that goes to the citation hearing officer who then A, makes a finding of whether the city made the correct decision or not. Um, generally, when it gets to that stage, we're pretty confident we made the correct decision. And then that uh, citation hearing officer has the ability to levy fines if this person is not um, acting correctly. The goal of that is not to collect fines, the goal is to gain compliance. So we do give, you know, and when I say we, it's the citation hearing officers, Try to give some leeway to get, say, all right, how much time do you need to correct this issue? Um, unfortunately, not everybody complies, so we do have to sometimes levy, um, put liens on the property. I think we've got over like $150,000 to put liens out there. But, you know, that's not a cure-all. It's not our goal, but that's just, you know, usually what happens in the, as part of the process. Um, so the, there's also the Aquifer Protection Agency, which is uh, the way Norwalk is set up. That's actually the Planning and Zoning Commission. So they, certain properties within the aquifer areas um, are licensed and strictly regulated on what they can do in their properties. Um, so in terms of storage of like chemicals, um, how they handle their fuels, all those things, there's an additional layer of oversight that's given to those properties in terms of how they have to manage their stormwater, their wastewater, everything that's done. Um, and once in a while, we have somebody that doesn't follow the rules. We had one last month where they're just not listening to what was stated. So that's when we bring it to the Planning and Zoning Commission, who's acting as the Aquifer Protection Agency, and then they can make a stricter enforcement on, on that process. Um, I mentioned the Conservation Commission earlier. That's under our branch as well. That's a seven-member body who has kind of two functions. Most, most of their time is spent as the inland wetlands agency where they're looking at properties that come in and they want to do some kind of development, whether it's a new house, addition to a house, land clearing, that's within uh, too close to the regulated areas. And regulated areas can be inland wetlands, they can be um, upland review areas. So it just depends on what the project is. So they, they kind of try to work with that property owner to come up with the best alternative that's the least impactful to the wetlands. So that, that takes up a lot of their time. They also have a conservation capacity where they're kind of looking at open space planning, which we work closely with um, Wrexham Park on that as well. So we kind of have some joint, joint uh, view of that. Hopefully within the next year or two, we'll be able to update the open space plan. Um, we did put in a request with the capital budget that wasn't funded this year, but we're optimistic going forward that we'll, we'll be able to do that. Um, we also have uh, two two bodies that are, they can kind of work in a uh, advisory capacity, but also have some administration function as well. First one being the historical commission. I'm not sure why it's a 10 member commission. There probably was a reason it was at the time. It's probably a little larger than it needs to be. Um, there are several vacancies on that commission now. They kind of have a couple of different functions where they look at historic properties, making sure the inventory is up to date, making sure that you know those are managed properly. And they also are involved in the dilemma, demolition delay process. And so if there's buildings over a certain age before those buildings can get knocked down, potentially they would have to go to the historic commission to um, you know gain their blessing unless they put a delay on that. Uh, the, the, the POCD, which is the Plan of Conservation Development, talks about the Historical Commission kind of evolving a little bit and maybe looking at becoming a Historic District Commission. That's a little bit more involved. There's a lot more steps that the city has to undertake with that. And that would basically involve certain areas of the city that could be designated as, as historic districts. And there's certain overlays and additional protections that are put on the properties in those areas. It's a bigger step that involves um, you know, a little more oversight, a little more training. So that's something that uh, our staff is working with the Historical Commission now and the Law Department on, on next steps for that. We also have the Harbor Management Commission, which is a very busy group, a nine member commission. And I think there is a vacancy or two on that board as well. And they're involved with operations at the Harbor. They work closely with um, 
Shellfish Commission and the Mayor's Water Quality Committee. And they're looking at operations in the harbor in terms of like the, the boat moorings and where those should go, kind of, you know, overall operations. And they're going to be heavily involved with the um, with the, the, the strategic plan that we're coming up with now, um, just making sure that everything flows with consistency with the harbor management. Um, I think we missed one or did I skip over it? But I'll talk to it. The Planning and Zoning Commission itself, which I skipped. Yeah, there are there was a slide. We don't know where it's somewhere. Um oh, did I just go over it? Ah, okay. Yeah, I read right through. So anyway, ignore it. So the Planning and Zoning Commission um, itself is a 12-member body, nine seated, three alternates. Um, they're a very busy group outside of council. I'd say they're probably the busiest, um, busiest group. Uh, Right now, there is one vacancy uh, for an alternate position. Um, we just got filled up with a regular seated member. We ended in the past. We had kept that open just to allow everybody to participate in things. But um, the, the prior to probably about three years ago, there was a separate planning commission and a separate zoning commission. Uh, we did a kind of extensive process of combining two, two commissions, and I think it's helped streamline the application process quite a bit because there was a lot of overlap with things. Um, they're, they're, like I said, they're a pretty busy group. They meet regularly twice a month. When we were doing the zoning regular right, zoning regulations rewrite, they were meeting weekly. And you know, some of our meetings go pretty lengthy. We have a hearing coming up Thursday night, which I'm gonna guess starts at six and ends at about 11. So if we won't finish that night, we just had another hearing and another application that spanned four different evenings, just because um, you know, the way Norwalk's built, it's, it's about 99% built. There's not a lot of land left that's, not claimed for some purpose. So anytime anything gets redeveloped now, we're down to these very specific contentious pieces of property and what happens on those affects people. Um, neighbors get very um, interested and I'd say emotional sometimes about these things because it affects them. And things that could happen on those properties might impact them. So there's a lot of you know emotion involved some of these applications, but the Planning Zoning Commission and staff really need to strict strictly kind of adhere to the process and the rules that we follow and make decisions based off the, the you know, the impacts from the property and, and the specific goals. But I think that's a pretty good summary of what they do. I think I got everybody and then I think I guess. Yeah. Steve doesn't have a lot of spare time going on here. It's <laughs> six committees commissions. So the last group that I want to talk about is transportation, mobility, and parking. And again, this is a new group um, from the reorg that I was talking about when we first started talking this evening. And um, this group is so critical and it's really, um, it, it, it has been born out of different departments, right? And sort of choosing, picking and choosing people to make up transportation, mobility, and parking. And they focus on the connectivity from residential neighborhoods to the business neighborhoods, um, what the roads and sidewalk networks look like around the schools, um, how we're looking at crosswalks, how we engage with residents on speed, um, and also issues of parking. So um, do we have residential parking? Do we have street parking? How are we uh, working with Steve and the Planning and Zoning Commission to be able to think of the need for parking? and you know, I can't really speak enough of this particular group because they're just, they're so um, broad in what they look like, look at, and so wide in their focus areas, but it really boils down to the connectivity piece and the mobility piece and making sure that we're looking at our major corridors um, and we are just kicking off a Route 1 corridor study. Um, and, you know, we're starting our Wall Street um, project for $27 million reconfiguration of Wall Street, including Burnell and River and teeing up the intersection at Mott and Belden. I mean, these are things that we've been talking about as a city for decades and decades, and we just haven't really um, been able to have the team in place to be able to have the vision to make these things happen. Um, transportation, mobility, and parking, uh, has actually secured about $27 million of federal and state grants in the last five years since they started. Um, and that's not the end of it. Uh, we have more announcements that are coming up. One of the more recent grants that was received was a connectivity grant when 95 came in and Route 7 came in and it really just split the neighborhoods and split um, 
the ability to walk from one neighborhood to the other. The federal government is investing money and we got $800,000 to be able to focus on connecting um, South Norwalk to Wall Street West Avenue underneath all of those bridge areas. Um, and so just a really great department as far as working with all of the other departments that are out there. Um, one of the things that we've been focused on with transportation, mobility and parking is the adoption of complete streets. And um, Councilperson Goldstein has been really involved in this, as well as all the other uh, council people as well. And it's because it's a huge effort, right? We know that when we go out and we pave the streets, we should be thinking about sidewalks and bike lanes and thinking about connectivity. And that's not only in the urban core, but it's also around the schools and how kids get to school um, safely. We've been doing walk audits around different schools. We were just up at Cranberry last week or the week before and noticed that some of the vegetation was over the sidewalk and the kids were having to walk out on the road to get around it. And so we're really taking the initiative as a team to not only get out and look at zoning violations and blight violations, but also getting out and walking the sidewalk and walking across the road and using the crosswalk and trying to dodge the traffic and then going out and writing a grant in order to be able to install something that helps people understand that they need to stop when there's pedestrians crossing the road. So um, we have three commissions that work with transportation, mobility, and parking, bike walk commission, parking authority, and the traffic authority. Um, they all do different things. Bike and walk actually came into play as a task force and then um, got established as a committee, I think in 2017. Um, and it really focuses on what is true at the heart of TMP, which is the, the bike and um, sidewalk and being able to have pedestrians really feel safe in the city. And that doesn't just relate to traffic, it also relates to lighting and it relates to the development and how Steve and the planning and zoning group has been working to update zoning and where the buildings are situated on the lots and how wide the lots are and things like that. You know, there are so many different components of this. The parking authority, um, whether you love it or you hate it, I'm sure you have strong feelings about it because usually people do. Uh, we have about 4,000 managed parking spots in the city. Um, they both include street parking spaces and managed lots. We also have a couple of parking garages like the Maritime Garage and the Sono Train Station Garage. Um, and this is a group of uh, folks that are appointed that help uh, manage a $7 million parking business or enterprise fund. The, the enterprise fund is a really interesting, unique animal um, in municipal government. Not only is the plan is the parking authority one, but also WPCA. Vanessa spoke about WPCA. Um, that's also an enterprise fund. So it um, there are revenues, and it is self. It's, it, there are revenues and then it basically manages itself outside of city government. And people may say, well, why is that the case and what does that look like? Well, when the funding goes into the general fund, then we start having, we start competing for priorities. And when we start competing for priorities, there sometimes can be deferred maintenance. And when you're having deferred maintenance on parking garages that need to be structurally sound or the assets that are in place, like the hardware um, and the software to make the paid parking work here in the city of Norwalk. Uh, we think it's really important that that stays in its own sort of area. Um, they work very closely, obviously they're staffed by the transportation mobility and parking team, but the revenue that comes from the parking goes back into the system to be able to keep that safe for everyone. And then the traffic authority, not only are they in charge of road closures for special events, um, but they also are in charge of if parking requirements or restrictions are changed on streets, if we put up stop signs or we put up yield signs, if we change traffic lights, if we talk about um, rerouting a road or changing one of the things we're talking about for Wall Street West Avenue is Burnell going from a one-way to a two-way so that we have the ability to get out of the Yankee Doodle garage and back on to um, Belden there. Um, and so the parking, the traffic authority oversees all of that. So it's a lot. We have about, we have uh, 13 commissions and one committee. And so, um, I'll, you know, as I said, when we first started, it's about quality of life and different people care about different things. And so we're really great to be able to focus on such a wide area of topics for the for the city itself and um, truth be known we just know that city overlaps and is so you know in every department is so integrated with the next department and so regardless of what you want to do and how you want to do it with the city um, you can reach out to any one of us because we all work together we meet weekly numerous times um, both together as a group this whole group that was here up in front or even separately and um, and I just, you know, sometimes you feel like you don't know who to reach out to and you don't really know even what exactly you want to reach out to them on because your list may be 10 or 15 things. But 
you know, we have coffee with folks all the time or meet up with people and walk the neighborhood. Um, and it really is about just comfort in knowing who's working at City Hall. It doesn't matter even what they're working on. It's that just that you have that connection and you have a name and a face to be able to call, right? And so um, I know Lamond and I get calls for all different things that have nothing to do with some of our focus areas, but it doesn't matter. Really, does it doesn't matter at all. You know, it doesn't, it's just great that we're, we're really grateful that people pick up the phone and call us in the first place. So um, I want to thank everyone for coming out and I want to thank um, our council president, Darlene Young, for being able to coordinate the meeting along with other council people. It's been a pleasure teaching you about Norwalk 101 and uh, I will just let Darlene close. Um, Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I know in the 2019 POCD, yeah. it mentioned sustainability and resilience plan. I know when CIRCA, the Connecticut Institute for Climate Resilience, warned Norwalk to plan for three feet higher water. Yes. And I believe a sustainability and resilience plan is required by the state. Yes. That wasn't mentioned here. Mm -hmm. I have written comments on, in response to the stormwater management plan, which allows for public comment mm -hmm. for the last few years, no one's ever answered me. I've written city leaders and the common council asking who's the sustainability director that the 2019 POCD mentions yeah. the city would have. And uh, when I Google it, because you can Google anything, I get Norwalk redevelopment, mm -hmm. which isn't mentioned at all in here. No, that's the one that I need to. to and say, yeah. well, you know, it's, I don't even know if they're subject to FOI, if they're a real city agency or a quasi city agency. You do read one of the many websites about Norwalk and it says redevelopment is about the inner city. And then they've just sent out a stormwater survey. Mm -hmm. So who's in charge of stormwater management? Yep. And that really wasn't mentioned in here. And who is our sustainability director? Mm -hmm. And why is redevelopment, which is focused on the urban core, responsible for building a citywide sustainability and resilience plan? Sure. Thank All you. good questions. Thank you. Um, so redevelopment agency is the one that I was talking about earlier um, that I need to mention. So thank you for the reminder. The redevelopment agency is actually a quasi public agency um, that has two plans. One is the uh, redevelopment plan for Wall Street West Avenue, and the second is a redevelopment plan for South Norwalk. And they actually oversee all of our administration for CDBG and HUD money, which is money that comes down from the federal government. They help to uh, build programs and programming for us and help um, um, to be able to administer that funding. In addition to that, they also help to add funds. When Brian Badoli, the executive director, came into the redevelopment agency, we sat down and actually did a strategic plan with the city, uh, with the city of Norwalk and the redevelopment agency, because the redevelopment agency was rebuilt to have a number of different technical skill sets that the city does not have in place. And that is the value of a redevelopment agency, that not only are there redevelopment plans for the urban core, but also they have a technical expertise that is not overlapped with the city, but fills gaps that the city may, cur may have, especially when it comes to development and thinking of all of these things that we've been talking about. Um, that strategic plan might be really helpful for folks to look at because the strategic plan actually lays out who is responsible for what, given the restructuring of the redevelopment uh, authority. And that was probably about three years ago now, three and a half years ago. Um, so getting to the POCD, the POCD is a state required document. It's called the Plan for Conservation Development. It's adopted in uh, every 10 years. It goes from 2019 to 2029. So there are 10 years in which you want to be able to achieve your goals that you have identified in the POCD. We actually track our progress on each of those items and each of those tasks. But in addition to that, we also have gone even further Planning and zoning um, reviews our capital budget each and every year, and every single capital item that we put into our budget, we actually have to tie back to the plan of conservation and development, and not just one particular chapter, but the chapter and the task and the element and the goal and mission that it's trying to achieve. And if it doesn't connect back to the POCD, then we need to have special justification um, as to why it wasn't identified in the POCD, because the POCD spent two or three years talking to residents about what residents want for the city and, and how they would like that. And so each one of those capital requests are tied to that. So 
um, not having a sustainable resiliency officer in place is not due to it not being a priority. It is a priority, but we have 2019 to 2029 to be able to do that. And as a matter of fact, the mayor um, put in $450,000 to be able to support the Office of Sustainability. That was announced only just a couple of months ago because what's been happening to date is that the redevelopment agency has been playing a role in resiliency and sustainability. We actually did an, a climate action plan and the climate action plan included greenhouse gas inventory, um, and that was also funded through ARPA. Um, and also through Steve's department, we've been doing a lot of the circuit grants and looking specifically at Water Street and how the flooding on Water Street can be mitigated. Um, and actually we've been, we received a second grant to be able to go out, um, two separate grants to be able to go out and further that work. So um, while we do not have a resiliency officer in place today, um, we will be, we're, we're trying to achieve that and we do have funding set aside to be able to do that. I think that, um, you know, it is, it's embedded in all of our work, and I know um, that we think about it each and every day. That's not enough, which is why we identified that $450,000 needs to be committed to a sustainability office and that that sustainability officer will sit in the mayor's office because they need to be able to work with each and every department, whether it's buying electric vehicles or putting in chargers on the sidewalks or being able to ensure that planning and zoning is doing work um, that addresses that. We also focused on the waterfront study um, and actually pulled back some of the zoning along Water Street in order to be able to address the um, those concerns from deep and some of the concerns for uh, intensifying density along that along that corridor uh, based on the flood that needs the flooding uh, predictions that are coming in and, and what we've been looking at. So. Um, it is a part of our work and uh, the redevelopment agency, although they are focused on the urban core, they have a technical skill set that gives us the ability to focus on some of these um, climate action plans and some of these things that are a citywide initiative. It wouldn't make sense for us to do a climate action plan only for a neighborhood or two neighborhoods. We need to do it citywide, but they allow us to have those technical skills to be able to do that. Correct. Correct. They are. Yes, they are. I will. You're welcome. All right, everyone. Thank you very much. Darlene, did you want to make some closing remarks? Okay, great. Diane Lorichella. Oh, okay. I thought I thought it was uh, ending. So thank you for picking up. Um, my name is Diane Lorichella. I just could not be there. I wanted to thank the council and the staff for uh, letting people know uh, many of the functions of uh, the, our, our big city. And uh, so I just wanted to uh, leave you with this. I will be following up with uh, emails and maybe a meeting. That is... Um, the issue of gender parity on our boards and commissions. Um, currently there are openings on the, I believe the shellfish and the Harbor commission. Now, um, I also believe of course in racial equity. However, uh, the issue of gender equity has been a problem in our city for over a decade. Um, and uh, I have spoken to the com permanent commission or the commission on the status of women. I think they're changing their name soon. And it's been difficult, uh, surprisingly, because I do know that um, this council and our mayor has, we have several women who are helping run departments, which is uh, terrific. However, um, the Harbor Commission has one female, the Shellfish has no females, and there are other commissions that we should at least, I believe, take a look at the over 51% of our population are women. And so I believe that we should at least have a goal of gender equity on all of our boards and commissions. And um, so I have not been able to make any traction. Um, the people on the, for instance, Shellfish and Harbor are terrific people. I love a lot of the guys. I just know in the case of Harbor Commission, there are women that own boats or that sail or that kayak. And I believe this city needs to make more of an effort to identify where we have fewer than, let's say, 30 percent 
of a border commission being uh, having gender equity. So I'll leave it at that. Um, of course, sustainability is number one on my list. It's partly what I do for a living, but also I have given a lot of time to the city. And I do think that we uh, need to take a look at what redevelopment agencies role is because while I do know you want to utilize people's skill sets, Jessica, the thing is they kind of operate in the shadows, even though of course their agendas are publicly known. Um, uh, I do think it would be ter more terrific if it was more transparent what their role is as far as sustainability and why they're being utilized as opposed to our zoning people or WPCA, that sort of thing. So with that, I thank you and thank you for letting me speak. Thank you very much. Yeah, so for everybody who um, would like to grab a packet at the back, all this information is captured in the packets there. But in addition, there's a flyer. On June the 23rd, we're doing our first um, installation project for Complete Streets at the intersection of uh, North Main and Ann Street. So at on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, if you are interested in coming down and helping us paint the street so that it's more narrow and being able to identify where the parklet should go and be able to do really cool stuff, um, we're going to have a lot of fun down there. And uh, the there's a QR code on the actual flyer so that we you can register. And then that way we can have enough, you know, enough paintbrushes and buckets and things like that for everybody to take part. So if you're interested, please register and tell all your friends about it because it's going to be a ton of fun. So the crowd is thinned out, of course, but we thank you all who, who have stayed through this. And I just have to say, this was amazing. And I think this is something that we should really think about doing on a regular basis, informing people and giving them this opportunity. Um, I learned some things too that I think I forgot. So um, thank you so much, um, Jessica, Steve, Lamont, for being here and staying. And this was, I hope everyone that was here and online found this very helpful. Um, I certainly did. But before we close, we have uh, our, our, our majority leader that's just gonna say a little bit about the charter revision, which is the most important thing that we are doing as a city right now. Um, and just very briefly, this will be a, a commission that will be appointed sometime in the late summer or fall. So for folks who are interested in getting involved, the city charter is essentially the city's constitution. We just did a big revision, um, got it approved with over 80% of the vote. Thank you, Norwalk voters. Um, that cleaned it up. It made it readable. It took all of the um, existing sort of powers and organized them. Now we have an opportunity to have a conversation about whether we want to make more substantive changes. So for folks who might be interested, um, we just had a great panel uh, last week on the role of the legislature, the role of the common council. You can find that online. I totally recommend it. It was absolutely fascinating. I have at least one other person who agreed with me, two people who agreed with me. Yes, so it was amazing. Um, there will be two more sessions coming up. These are broad conversations. We're getting input from folks around the state of Connecticut who are talking about their experiences with their government structures so that we can gather ideas, see what we might think might work in Norwalk or that we're really happy with what we have. Um, so the one that's coming up uh, July 30th will be on the budget process. And then on September 9th, it will be on the mayor's role and balancing the uh, council and the mayor. So we really encourage people to come out. The conversation is super interesting. People, again, from all sorts of um, different kinds of government structures in Connecticut, it's actually quite amazing how much variety there is. Um, among the 169 towns. Um, and you know, if you are interested in getting more involved in the charter revision process, you know, the, the council will be collecting resumes. So this is yet another volunteer opportunity we'd love to see people get engaged with. So thank you all very much. And, and just lastly, as Ms. Uh, uh, Nora mentioned, resumes. This was done to collect resumes as well. We, we provided you with the information, but we want to engage the community. And so there are ways to um, submit your resume. You can submit them through Esther Marullo, who is the assistant city clerk. And I think there's also a software where you can actually just go on the city's website, look at what you're interested in and upload your resume. And so we encourage everybody that's interested in something to do that. And with that, everyone get home safe and have a good night. Thank you so much. Thanks.